Right, so Peter. Yes. Uh, grandson of Percy. And before these young ladies unveil the plaque in uh, memory of Percy and everything he did, uh, can you give a big hand and the biggest applause he's ever had in his life for Peter? situation and I'd like to thank him right now and give him love for doing that. Well that'll be the day when you say goodbye, yeah, that'll be the day when you make me cry, I say you gonna leave, you know the like us, that'll be the day when I die, when you kiss me all your love and then you Savarin and the Democrats way back in uh, 1963. Mike Jones said, I think this is a record by your group that's on Peter's website as Unknown Band. So I listened, and it was. Yeah. Wow, that's cool. So I got in touch with Peter Phillips, who lived in London. Yeah. yeah. And I said, you got a record of mine? Where is it? Yeah. <laughs> so I went to see him. Well, I've got a record label, so why don't we release them? Yeah. He said, would you? I said, yeah, I'll do the lots. He said, because well, people only wanted the quarry men and Billy Fury and Ken Dodd. Well, right. So uh, I took the lots, and this is 18 months ago. Yeah. And I thought, now, how do we launch this slot? So I phoned up the cavern and spoke to John. We did our thing. We signed up Peter Phillips, his record collection, and Bob's your uncle. 18 months later, here we are at the launch, and it's great. I have heard the name of 
story about um, John Lowe who was in the Quarrymen, the piano player yeah. in the Quarrymen, had that disc of his in a drawer for yeah. literally 23 years. Yeah. This is a similar story because we had Grandpa's archive yeah. in a boxes actually in the loft you yeah. Know? Yeah. and I'd, over the years I'd wanted to have his name better known than it yeah. was you know and I met Paul in uh, 1991, we were both working together in a TV studio down in London and we had a conversation about it and he was just putting together with George Ringo and Neil Aspinall he was putting together the anthology project yeah. so he went and had another look at that re- the disc that he had owned at that time the world's rarest record they call it now yeah. and so that and then in the sleeve notes of anthology one there was a little tribute to Percy Phillips so that was the point at which I started a website and we started getting a bit of interest but it was all from a historical point of view, you know. So 30 years passed by. Yeah. And um, I happened to meet Pete Goodall. Yeah. And he made a record at the studio, his first record in 1963. So he came to visit me. And we d- when I looked through my archive, if dis- his disc was in my archive. Right. So um, so the, the project developed. Then that's about 18 months ago. Yeah. So suddenly we had the opportunity then. To get, to get a project going so that's what we did and Pete's record company facilitated it so it's like 30 years work on my part but during those years I'd written various things about Grandpa, about the studio about the, all the discs that were made there I'd had them all scanned so we came to the point where I had when Pete suggested that we'd get a project going so I had all this stuff in storage so to speak the discs themselves and all these various bits of notes that I'd made over the years I'd got them all notated, the tracks, track length. I'd written notes about each track, what I knew about each performer. But because some of them are people talking. That Everton disc, have you heard that? I've not heard that yet, no. In 63, uh, they won the league and they came into the studio. The Brian Labone team, it was right, that yeah, one. Yeah. Quarrymen stuff was released, yeah. and all the Quarrymen did interviews and that, especially John Lowe and Colin Anton, who were more, you know, available, shall we say. Yeah. Great guys, great musicians, are really... Yeah, so they tell the story, of course, of uh, the Quarrymen experience. And so that, that sort of became the story of everyone knew about the studio, and there was no other story. Yeah. And so they had, because they were young lads, and he was, you know, in 63 when they did their recording, and they were all young teenagers... They saw him as a grumpy old bloke, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I, that did that niggled with me. I wanted to dispel that myth, because he wasn't a grumpy old bloke. He was a really cool fellow, you know? From being a baby, I knew him really well, you know? We, me and my sister used to spend hours in the record shop in the 60s, sitting on the counter, playing the records, and then we'd run into the studio and mime, you know, using the, the re- microphones and that, how you used to when we were kids, mime to records and that. And, uh, and gran- Grandma and, and Grandpa... They were both lovely people, you know. They'd had, they'd been had that business for thirty years, you know, yeah. and all the people in the neighbourhood knew him, you know. But he always was, he was professional guy. He wore one of them dun-coloured shop coats, you know, 
shirt and tie, but not crisp, you know, yeah. just neat, you know, tied professional, you know. He was really a professional guy. These guys knew that they could dismantle that, that yeah. tape deck right there. He could dismantle that yeah. and put it back together. You know, if it went wrong, he'd just fix it himself. You know, he didn't send it off to the dealer. Everyone knew how, every, you know, I'm sure you, when you were a kid and you got your first car, yeah. you knew how to change yeah. the oil and check the plugs. You know, in them days, people knew how to fix stuff. The guys had a soldering iron, didn't they? Yeah. And if your radio broke, you'd take the back off and you'd spot something and you'd solder it, you know, or musicians would fix their guitar leads or whatever. You know. Grandpa gave me some great tips one time. I was playing in this band in the early 70s and we used to do Zeppelin covers, you know. Me, me guitarist, he wanted distortion. So we were around at Grandpa's house in Kensington one day, me and me dad, and I, and I said, oh, Grandpa, me, me guitarist in the group, he wants a distortion pedal. And me dad and Grandpa burst out laughing, said, distortion? We've been trying for 40 years to get rid of distortion. <laughs> what do you want distortion for? So he goes into the workshop and he got a metal box and he made a little distortion pedal with a button on it and he just passed it to me like that with two jack plugs in and out, you know. So And it was full, absolute, sorry, absolute, <laughs> absolutely brilliant uh, distortion. Very pedal, brilliant, you know. yeah. It yeah, sounded yeah. just like Jimmy Page. you lately that I love you. Could I tell you once again somehow? Well, have I told with all my heart and soul how I adore you? Well, darling, I'm telling you now. Have I ever told you lately when I'm sleeping? Every dream, my dream is you somehow Have I told you why the nights are lonely You're not with me Well, darling, I'm telling you now My heart would break into if I should lose you I'm no good without you anyhow Well, have I told you lately that I love you? Well, darling, I'm a tell you For instance, that Billy Fury acetate that he made in uh, 1958, April 1958, there's five tracks on that. The first two tracks on side one are just about audible now. It's <laughs> together now. <laughs> yeah, Come on, you can go in as well. <laughs> <laughs> that's what they're like. Yeah. And um, but the third track and then the two tracks on side two sound fantastic, man. Because yeah. he he used to put those on to audition or whatever, and and then after two tracks they'd heard enough. Yeah. You're yeah. in. So they never really got right. played side two. Yeah. So they still sound really crisp, you know. And Grandpa had mastered the. The depth they had to cut out, you right, know, because yeah. you've got an acetate disc. It's a disc of aluminium, and then they use um, shellac, copal, shellac, which is crushed beetle wings, exactly. by the way. Yeah. Copal, which is a very hard mineral, and our silica flour or a very fine clay. They'd mix all that up. It's a recipe, and then when it was mixed and ground fine, 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 they put it through a steam press, which made and they put a colorant in as well. So you got out with this black dough, and then they cut off a piece which would, when pressed, became a 10-inch or 7-inch. And then they'd put that either side of the acetate and squash it, you know, press it, and there's your, there's your acetate. But it weighs quite a bit. So um, Billy Fiori's one, it still sounds fantastic today, side two, anyway, you know. So they're not that fragile, you could, but you have to know how deep to cut, because yeah. if you cut too deep, you go through to the, to the aluminium. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so it took him a, a few goes to get that, that skill to be able to do that. So your original question was, why did he do it? Yeah. He had a brainwave. That's the answer to that question. Yeah. And then he bought the gear, which, in, incidentally, was state-of-the-art gear. It was only been made a year or two before, you know, that MSS studio. Yeah. And another thing in the Beatles' telling of the story, in Colin Anton and John Lowe's telling was that like it was some kind of grotty old studio with a yeah. single mic hanging from the ceiling well that's their memory but 
in reality, it was a state of the art. Well, they were only kids at the time, anyway. Exactly. Weren't they? Yeah. Yeah. And nothing yeah. was hanging from any ceilings. The yeah. mics were on stands, you know. Yeah. And he positioned them scientifically. Yeah. And when you listen to that acetate, as I'm sure you have, of the quarrymen, I think that's three lads like we're standing now, exactly yeah. like yeah. this, around the microphone. And then over here, 